Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message from Dr. Miles Monroe, provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Let's talk about understanding the power of fasting. Now, we're dealing with two subjects during this fast, prayer and fasting. But I'm going to talk about fasting first because I want to make sure you are safe. Notice I put the word power next to the word fasting. Because prayer has power, but fasting has its own level of power. Fasting is like adding a new combustion horsepower engine to your old engine. Fasting is taking your normal life to another level it never been to before. It's like adding another cylinder to your car. So fasting provides power that is not normal. And I know what I'm talking about personally. I call fasting the kingdom key to power in prayer. You can pray and still not get results. But it's impossible to pray and fast and not get results. And there are some times when our prayer doesn't have an effect. But it's always guaranteed that when you add fasting to your prayer it has an effect most of us have not been encouraged to fast we have not been taught to fast and I want to begin with some general statements all religions pray so prayer is common the Buddhists pray the Hindus pray the Muslims pray. The Universalists pray. Even the Satanist church pray. So prayer is not unique. Prayer is not unique to the church or religious people who are called Christians. In many cases, many religions pray more than Christian people. Now, whether they get answers is another question, but they pray more. I, I, I'm sure you are aware, you know, that religions like the Hindus, they would pray for hours. Uh, the Buddhists would meditate for hours and, and practice meditation for hours, and they would be trying to become one with the universe. And, and this meditative prayer, they can be sitting out uh, with their legs crossed, praying and meditating for days. And the Muslims pray at least three times a day. Wherever they are, they spread their rug on the ground and they face toward the east, where Mecca is, and they pray. Most Christians don't pray that much. So prayer is not the issue. Everybody does it. Of course, questions that come up in your mind. Uh, who are you praying to? What are you praying? And whether your prayer will be heard or whether it's being heard at all, these are questions that are out there. Christ himself told the Pharisees, you pray and you think that you might be heard because of your much speaking. He was talking to these Judaizers, Judaism leaders, who were praying to Jehovah, the God you serve. But he says, you think you will be heard because you pray these long prayers. In other words, you can even be a believer in Jehovah and still not get your prayers answered. So it's not just the Muslim and the Buddhist and the Hindu and Confucius and all the others. Even the saints called the Christians could be praying and not get any answers because he said, your much speaking doesn't guarantee answers to prayer and again we learn in this 
consecration that prayer has very little to do with how long you pray. Big words don't impress God. So prayer is common. Point number two, prayer is not an option for us. It is a necessity. God didn't leave prayer up to a decision that you make. He made it a command. Prayer is a command. You shall pray, God says. When you don't pray, you are disobedient. So you are about to enter into an experience that's going to make God very pleased with you. And when you bring pleasure to God, he then delivers what he promised. So prayer is a command. It's a law. It's a command. That leads me to point number three. Prayer is the most common experience of the believer. And what I mean by that is every time anyone gives their lives to the Lord, they are told they should pray. So every believer is encouraged to pray. It's the most common thing you are expected to do. But here's the problem. Prayer is the most talked about subject, but least practiced. We would rather sing in the choir than pray. We would rather be an usher at the door than spend time in prayer. We'd rather pay the, play the piano in church than pray. We'd rather work in the hospitality department or work in the nursery than spend time in prayer. In other words, we would want any other activity except, please don't tell us to pray. We kind of place prayer as the thing we do once in a while when somebody makes us feel guilty about it. But I hope that you will find out that prayer is not an option anymore. And you'll see it as your most important work. Why don't people pray? Here's my answer. Because of results. They don't get results. I was brought up in a religious environment just like you. And I always question this. Why is it that on Sunday mornings, for those of you who worship on Sundays, the church building is packed with people, and if you are a Sabbath worshiper, on Saturday mornings, the church building is filled with people. And if you are a Muslim, you would find that during the worship times, everybody is in the mosque. But there's a problem, I notice. During the prayer meeting night, Everybody gone. And the only people that attend a prayer meeting are some old women who ain't got nothing to do. We call them intercessors. What we really call, what we really mean by that is those who pray because we don't pray. That's an intercessor to you. Those who pray because we ain't got time to do it. The prayer meeting is always the smallest meeting in every church. Check it out. I mean, to have this many people in a prayer meeting right here, this is somebody's entire church. And I've gone and I've been in churches in my life where they had a lot of people on Sunday morning and prayer meeting is like 10 people. Question, why? The answer, because people don't get results. I think I'm just like you. If you keep doing something and it ain't working, you stop doing it. That's logical, eh? It's like going to a soda machine and putting in your quarters and hitting the bar and nothing comes out. You put some more quarters in, hit the bar, nothing comes out. Now after four or five dollars, hopefully by then you figure out, I better leave this machine alone. Well, that's the way prayer is for most people. They pray, they've gone to a prayer meeting. Sometimes, you know, you're a young Christian, you can't wait to get to prayer meeting, you're excited. And then you, finally you figure out why the other folks ain't there. Because you ain't getting no answers to prayer. These old people praying, ain't nothing working. You ain't getting no responses. You don't see any evidence. There's no, there's no kind of re response to, from God. So you begin to say, this ain't working. 
And so you quit. That's why people don't pray. Because they don't get answers. But here is what I call the prayer principle. When you study the word of God carefully and God's action in history, you will come to a conclusion that John Wesley came to years ago. I thought he did a great job in expressing it. I understood it myself, but John Wesley said this. He said, it seems that without God, man cannot do anything on earth. But without man, God will not do anything on earth. Beautiful statement. Without God, man cannot. And without man, God will not. There's some things God wants to be done on earth for his kingdom. He wants his kingdom to come on earth. But he cannot do it without man, and man cannot do it without God. In other words, prayer is really a partnership between the divine and mankind. God needs you, and you need God. The point is, what happens on earth doesn't really depend on God. It depends on you. When I learned this, I became a prayer meeting, walking on two legs every minute. I pray all the time. I don't go to prayer meetings. I am a prayer meeting. Anybody who hung around me will hear me praying all the time. Some of them might just say, Jesus is Lord. I'm praying. Jesus is Lord. I'm calling his ownership in my environment all the time. Why? Because God can do nothing on earth without a human giving him release. Let me quote a scripture that proves this. Jesus said, wherever any two of you shall touch and agree concerning anything on the earth, then it shall be done by your Father who is in heaven. Simple statement, profound implications. He's telling us that heaven wants to do a lot of things on earth, but heaven is waiting for at least two humans to get together and touch in faith and agree in prayer on something on the earth. Then God has permission to do it from heaven. So earth depends on heaven to get things done, but heaven depends on earth for permission to do it. So without you, God will not. That leads me to point number three. Prayer is really earthly license for heavenly interference. What is prayer? Think about what it means. Prayer is man giving God license to interfere in earth's affairs through man's agency of faith. God cannot do in earth what you don't believe he can do. Christ says, according to your belief, be it unto you. So what happens here depends on what we believe God can do. Many times when God meant humans, he would tell them what he wanted to do. Then he would say this, do you believe I can do this? The word believe is the word pistis in Greek. It's the word we translate as faith. According to your faith, I can do it. One time the Bible says Jesus Christ went to his own hometown, Nazareth. But he couldn't do any miracles there because the people did not believe him. Now, can you imagine all the power of the universe was in a body walking in your village and can't heal you because you won't believe. What man does can block God or release God. For the next three weeks, you are going to become what I call a bigger and bigger and bigger pipe. 
for God to flow through. Something good is going to happen on earth in the next three weeks. But if we don't meet to agree, God can't release what he wants to do in the earth. So we give him license. That leads me to point number four. Write this down. Prayer is not an option, therefore it's a necessity. Necessity means God depends on you to petition him so he could get something done that he always wanted to do in the earth. And this is why most of the time when you talk about prayer in the Bible, if you read a verse in the Bible concerning prayer, it begins with a letter, with a, with a word, with two letters. If. Most of the scriptures con concerning prayer begins with that word. If. Because it's a condition. There's a verse that religious people always quote when they want God to do something in their country. What's that verse? If my people. See, it starts with an if. But they don't read the whole verse properly. <laughs> like turning from your wicked ways, no more sweethearting. See, you know, they want God to heal the lamb, but they don't want to deal with them other conditions, see? Yeah. Always a condition. It is necessary for us to pray for God to do what he wants. And this is why when we talk about the keys of the kingdom, I want to read the words of Jesus himself, the king. Write these words down, please. In Matthew 6, verse 5, Christ, at the beginning of his ministry, laid down this priority. He said, and when you pray. That's enough for me right there. Everybody say it together. And when you pray. He didn't say, if you pray. If I say to you, and when you come. You can get such and such a thing from my house. What am I saying? I even ain't asking whether you're coming, hey. You are coming. You're certain to come. Look at his words. He didn't say, if you find time in your busy schedule. He takes it for granted that you got this covered. And when you pray, he expects it. Everybody knows it, but we don't do it. And so we always relegate prayer to a small group of people who we say are intercessors. Now, an intercessor in the minds of religious churches is what I call professional prayers. <laughs> These are people who we have appointed, so to speak. Matter of fact, some of them are self-appointed. But we kind of have this group of people who are the ones who do what we should be doing, but don't do. And we use them to substitute for us. No one can do that. I can pray for you but I can never substitute for you for praying. Here's something to remember. I was shocked when I discovered this. I was 17 years old. I was on a fast. And the Lord said this to me. There's no such thing in the Bible as an intercessory ministry. I started rebuking God. I said, my mother's an intercessor. My mother prayed all the time. God said, yeah, but that ain't no ministry. There's no gift of intercession in the Bible. Find it. It doesn't exist. There's no gift of prayer in the Bible. It's gift of tongues, gift of miracles, but no gift of prayer. Do you know why? Because it ain't a gift. Everyone's supposed to do it. But we love intercessors because they 
take care of what we are guilty of. We, and we say to them, you pray for us. We're going to go and watch TV. So during prayer meeting evening, everybody is home drinking their switcher and watching television while a few old folks who ain't got nothing to do are praying. This is not God's will. Jesus said, men everywhere ought always to pray. All men everywhere, he says. Not a few chosen specialists. Prayer is not a ministry for the few. It's a necessity for the all. I don't get me wrong. People should pray for you. And I thank God that people pray for me all the time. I got people who intercede for me. and Boy, I thank God for that. But they should never... I should never think that they could replace my praying for myself. I hope this fast will change your attitude toward your prayer life. Prayer is a necessity. I want to put this up here for you to remember this, because some of you all got books on prayer in your house. Prayer books are like cooking books, cookbooks. How many of you got cookbooks in your house? Let me see your hand. All cookbooks, let me see your hand. You got cookbooks in your house. Come on, wave high. Be honest. God looking for me. Tell the truth. Okay. Do you all use them? Don't you lie. You don't, you don't use them cookbooks. <laughs> Once in a while, you might want to find one, how to make one cookie or something. Now, those cookbooks be in your house for 10 years. And in those books are powerful recipes to produce beautiful products of food but you don't use them in other words having a recipe and baking a cake is two different things studying prayer and praying is different having a good book by Finney in your house is nice but are you praying Finney prayed <laughs> Charles Finney prayed Oswald Chambers Powerful books on prayer. He prayed. You don't put this book on your coffee table so folks can see your beautiful prayer book and they think you are spiritual. <laughs> prayer books are for praying. You learn how to pray. The book I wrote on prayer is from my life. That's why people quote me. I write from my experience. I write from what God did for me. Because it has to be something that worked for me before I tell you it can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Don't just study prayer. Pray. Don't just read about prayer. Pray. Don't listen to other people's stories about prayer. Pray. That's what he expects. What is prayer? We'll deal with this a little later in detail, but I want to give you the definition before we go. The word prayer is the word petition. And the word petition means a legal appeal or demand on a government based on constitutional right protected by law. Complicated, but please write it down. Prayer is... Petition. Petition is a legal appeal or a demand that you place on a governmental authority. And that demand is based on a constitutional right. And the right is protected by law. That's what prayer is. That's what the word means in scripture. If you look at that statement, right away you can tell that you can't beg. Prayer is not begging for anything. Prayer is more of an appeal or a demand based on legal rights. God in the next three weeks don't want you hanging around his throne begging for nothing. He want to do business with you. He has some things to do on earth. 
and you are now positioning yourself in a consecration so that he can finally find a channel to get it through. You're going to learn that fasting is interesting. Fasting, <laughs> I remember when I began to learn to fast. I learned to fast from my mother and father. But my mother especially, she had some books around the house written by men like Shambach and A.A. A. Allen. And all Roberts. And I kept thinking, these men got so much spiritual power. I want that power. And they used to say, you got to pay a price. And I began to study it. And then I began to do it as a teenager. And my life turned upside down when I had my first fast, seven days. That's when I wrote a song. The song is called Living with Jesus on the Other Side. I wrote that on a fast. And I began to understand that fasting was like a plunger. <laughs> it was like Drano for a human life. And I discovered that food is like rust in a pipe, clogging up the hole. And the more you eat, the smaller the hole in the pipe until you become so clogged up that God can't get nothing through you. Got the picture? And some of you are that way right now. You've eaten so much the last eight months that you, you, you yourself can't get nothing through you. <laughs> Am I right about it? You are so physically clogged up that mentally you can't even think straight. Your mentality is affected. Your health has been slowed down. You get tired climbing steps. Imagine spiritual clog. And fasting is the only way to flush that stuff out. Your flesh is your greatest blessing and curse. It's a blessing because you need it to live on earth. It's a curse because it can become your ruler. Fasting puts your body back where it belongs. Under your spirit. Fasting takes your body and submits it to the spirit. Well, let's be honest. Sometimes you don't want to eat, right? Spiritually. You tell God, I, I'm going to fast today. But your body begins to whoop you. As a matter of fact, that's the same day they decide to have a party in the office with chicken and macaroni and peas and rice. <laughs> and all of a sudden, your body grabs your spirit, body slams it, stands over it and say, we're going to eat today. <laughs> and all the people in the saints say, amen. You surrender to your dirt body. Fasting grabs that, puts it back in order. Prayer is you petitioning God based on your rights as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, we'll deal with this in detail during this fast, how this works. You're going to see some scriptures you never saw before in your life. I'm going to show you some thoughts from the Bible that are going to change the way you were taught all your life about prayer and fasting. Ladies and gentlemen, let's talk about the effects of fasting. I like this one. What happens when you fast? First of all, fasting changes you. Now, why did I say that? Because number two is a contradiction. 
fasting does not change God. God never changes. Ain't nothing wrong with God. God ain't clogged up. <laughs> the clogging got to be on the other side. Fasting doesn't change God. It doesn't move God. It moves and changes you. The best way to describe God and your life in a fast is before you fast or live a fasted life, it's almost like a big tank with 50,000 gallons of water in it. And a little pipe is hooked up to it, a small little two-inch pipe. To this big tank. The amount of water that's available is 50,000 gallons. But the amount that can flow through your little pipe is one tenth of a gallon. The amount that's available doesn't change. But the amount that flows out through the pipe depends on the size of the pipe. God is always 50,000 gallons ready to do some stuff, but he can't find pipes to hook up big enough. And most of the pipes hook up to them, they all clog up. With sin, food, grits. <laughs> and peas. Grits and peas, Jesus help me. With salt beef in it. Ooh, I feel that noise right there. This is your last go round. You better enjoy it now. <laughs> God is ready to work anytime, but he keeps running into these pipes that are so small, clogged up. And they're making plenty of noise, you know. <laughs> they're shouting, claiming, confessing. God said, But you clogged up. The Lord can do anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't have nothing but this little, this little hole you got. You ain't got a fasted life. Fasting is the most important aspect of prayer. It doesn't move God. Number three, fasting increases your spiritual capacity. It's like going back to the tank, removing the two-inch pipe, and putting a 15-inch pipe to it. Now more water can flow. God says, look, I need to find some people who will increase their capacity to handle my flow. Let me tell you something. Okay, let's I'm read the scripture, quote the scripture again. We love the scripture, okay? When there's crime in a country, economic chaos, social decay, immorality in a country, what do we do? Let's call a prayer meeting, we say. So all the bishops get together, and we get in the park, and all the saints come along with their bellies full of grits. <laughs> the bishop belly, bigger than anybody else's belly. Oh, watch this now. And they come to pray for what? A nation. Watch this, a nation. Now, you know how big a nation is? Do you know how complicated a nation is? Do you know how complicated crime is and broken homes and, and abuse? These are big problems. And you come to God, this small little pipe. I want you to heal the nation, please. God said, the stuff I need to heal your nation, that pipe ain't going to work. So what's God? If my people who claim to be called by my name if they what okay write the word humble down the word humble in my book I talk about this the word humble to humble means to fast the translation in the English was not a good translation it means to humble it means to fast and pray you want God to heal a big problem? He need a big pipe. The demon that was in that boy must have been a legion. 
Because they prayed for that little boy, remember? They, they prayed all afternoon and the demon wouldn't come out. And when Christ came down from the mountain, it came out in seconds. Question, what was he doing in the mountain? Let me read the verse before. It says he ran aside alone to pray and to fast. When he came down, no food. Fellas down there full of fish. <laughs> come out, come out. Demon said, Yo, your pipe too small. I ain't coming out of this brother. And the Bible says, Jesus just said, out. Demon <laughs> left. The disciples prayed the same prayer. Jesus prayed. Different results. And they were ashamed, the Bible says. Because all the people saw that. And the next morning, they were at a meal. And they were all quiet. I don't blame them. They were sitting in the room, everybody eating like they're spiritual. <laughs> they were all thinking, he just embarrassed us before all them people. And one of them built the courage. And Peter said, Lord, why couldn't we cast that demon out yesterday? Christ says, well, this kind doesn't come out just by prayer. This needs a big capacity. If you are trying to figure out something right now in your life, for the last six months, maybe a year, maybe two years, you've been trying to work on something, and it seems as if it just wouldn't break. I'm giving you the biggest secret now. If you know you're supposed to have it, if you know it's God's will and the promise in the word, if you know this is God's legal right for you, if you know you're supposed to have it, then you're supposed to break that thing. And you break it by fasting. This is going to be the best three weeks you ever spent in your life. Things that were held up for three years are going to come out in three weeks. When God has a capacity big enough, he, when he begins to flow, every demon that was holding back will be swept away by the power of God flowing through a fasted life. Are you ready to fast? Say yes. Fasting is the most powerful force in prayer. It widens your pipe. It cleans out all the dirt. It wipes out all the refuse. It takes away every hindrance that was holding you back. That's why the devil loves you to eat. Especially when you set your face to fast. That's when they want to take you out for lunch for your birthday and pay for it. I'm telling you, you watch the next three weeks, I'm telling you, every demonic influence will show up. Promise me. But you remember what I said tonight. Just tell the temptation, I know why you came. And you ain't going to win. Because I'm going to clean this pipe out in the next three weeks. More work is done by fasting and prayer than work itself. Save yourself a lot of struggle by fasting and prayer. Write this down. Fasting breaks habits and spiritual bondage. Habits. Now, when we say habits, the first thing you think about is cigarettes and drugs and alcohol. But let me tell you something. There's some habits you get that are destroying your life. Some of you got to break the habit of television. You religiously watch certain programs. LMN. <laughs> oxygen. Amen. Oh, Lord, I'm getting in trouble now. You all need oxygen. You got to get away from that to breathe again. It's, it's amazing. It's a habit, and it steals your time. And sucks away your spiritual life. And some of the stuff that show on that, I tell my wife, I don't like some of these stories. No, no. Husband killing wife and then sleeping with the daughter. I mean, I'm like, what is this? this my head can't get around this. Feeding stuff to your spirit. You can fast. Coca-Cola. A habit. Ten tablespoons of sugar is in every can of Coke. Ten tablespoons. Did you know that? Every time you drink a Coke, there's enough sugar to give you diabetic reaction. Habit. Oh, but you need your Coke. I can't get started with my Coke. <laughs> Might as well call it Coke can. 
Fasting breaks habits. You got habits with pornography? Man, you lock into a fast? I'm talking about a serious fast like this one. And you say, Lord, three weeks. Let me tell you something. The Holy Spirit has some power that will break your mental bondage from that stuff. You only can break it with a fast. You keep praying for God to remove things and they won't go away. You need to fast. Unfaithfulness to your spouse is a habit. Fasting, break that thing. Sex. Fasting will bring sex back in order faster than anything else can. The bondage that you are under, prayer alone doesn't break most of that bondage. You need to fast. And number five, fasting quiets the heart to hear God's voice. You know, when I was a young teenager, when I began to fast, that's when I began to get revelations about the kingdom. Fifteen years old, I began to fast. And I saw a Bible that my parents never saw. My father comes here and sits on the front row and takes notes while I teach. And my father is a Baptist minister. And one time he said to me, son, where do you get all of this from? He said, you never learned this from our Baptist church. I said, no, sir. I learned this on a fast. God can speak to you things that he cannot speak to you while you're chewing. Do you know every time you eat, it takes six hours for your stomach to digest it? Which means that your brain is engaged for six hours after you eat and cannot focus on anything else. That's why before you take an exam, you shouldn't eat. Did you know that? You shouldn't eat no food before you take an exam. Most people say, take it. No, you don't want to eat. You want all of your focus to be on recall. That's why you failed the exam. You ate before you went. I can eat breakfast. Then breakfast destroyed your exam. <laughs> oh, I'm serious. Your, your body, once you drop food in your stomach, you think it's over. Your body begins to work after you swallow it. It kicks in. When I was in college, I fasted before every exam. And got honest. Because there's no distraction in the mind when the body is under control. No one taught you this. They didn't teach me either. I had to go learn this. Fasting quiets the heart so you can hear God. It calms down the distractions. I promise you, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to have more peace in your mind the next three weeks than any other time in the last five years. Because fasting calms your spirit because your spirit becomes more important than your body and it takes over. And your spirit ain't got no problems. Did you know that? Only your mind. And when your spirit becomes bigger than your mind and your body, your mind becomes subject to your spirit and your spirit is full of the peace of the kingdom. It brings quietness. On a fast, after you had the eighth day, you become, watch this, you can become very nice to everybody. On the eighth day, some of you have been through this. Because all of a sudden, your whole life takes on a purity. You see people properly. There's a peace. Half of the time we're angry is because we eat something. <laughs> it ain't settled with us yet. We... we <laughs> Fritz, watch that coconut tart. <laughs> you know, we eat stuff and then we get mad at people for the whole day. <laughs> because the whole body is completely confused about trying to get rid of this stuff. And we get irritated. Fasting quiets the heart to hear God's voice. And number six, fasting brings godly intimacy. Oh, I long for fast because of this one. I just can't wait to fast. 
I fast all through the year. But this fast, I sanctify for the whole church and for those watching us around the world. I, 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 I try and, and build into you a love for fasting. Because fasting makes intimacy with God a priority. Ooh. When you begin to give away control of your body, you attract God to your spirit. When you fast, you're telling God he's more important than peas and rice, hamburgers, and barbecue chicken <laughs> ribs. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Who I felt annoying just now. <laughs> God loves to know he is numero uno. Is he number one this week? Let's give a praise. He's number one. We're telling God you are number one for the year. This whole year, you are number one, and we're going to prove it by putting aside our own desires. And we're going to seek after your face. Boy, God loves it. God says, you will seek me, and you will find me. Only if you seek me with all your heart. God knows whether it's with all your heart. And so, if you want intimacy with God, you're about to get it. I saw a voice of scripture here that I thought was interesting. I'll give you some scripture before we close. Just to show you how important fasting is to getting things done. Now, in Jamaica, they've got crime problems in Kingston. In the Bahamas, we got the highest crime rate we ever had in the history of our country last year. And we already started out bad again. In Trinidad, they are afraid to come out of, the, out of their doors, kidnapping. Colombia, Mexico, the drug wars, people dying, kids are carrying guns. I mean, the whole place is a mess. Now, these are what? National problems, eh? All right. Esther had a national problem. Esther's problem was the government of the day had some people in the cabinet who didn't like her people. And they created a legislation in the government which required that her people be killed by law. Now this little girl, God, God didn't have to use Esther. He just looking for a pipe. Do you realize you could be the key to your neighborhood right now in this fast? God's trying to find a pipe. Let's read what made Esther a pipe. Esther chapter 4, verse 16. Esther is talking. She says, go. Gather together the Jews, that's the ones that they want to kill, who are here in Susa. And Fast for me. Okay? Get that part? You all fast as a group, he says. She said, do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Complete fast. That's a tough one. And I and my maids in this palace will fast as you do. Boy, God, I got some pipes in this city. Now, they were praying before that, you know. But Esther figured this out. Our prayer is not changing this thing. Anybody feeling excited? There's some things that you've been trying to figure out. God's about to do some stuff in the next three weeks that nobody could stop. Everyone talks but Esther, but they don't read this verse. I've come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Yes, but what you going to do now that you're in the kingdom? She was in the kingdom. She was in the palace. She had to fast to get things done. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are a queen in the palace, 
What food is out of your reach? You can eat. This is amazing. I wonder how she told her husband, I ain't eating today. She's a queen. All that food, anything she could order. Esther realized, I got to do something to make my prayer effective. I like Esther. She didn't say, y'all fast for me and left it like that. That's like intercessors, you know, y'all deceive for me. She says, I ain't trusting y'all alone. I can do this myself too. This is going to take personal consecration. And Esther's success, watch this. She says, and when this is done, I will go to the king. And even though it is against the law, wow. y'all don't understand. When you know you paid your bills to God, come on somebody. When you know you did exactly what he said, when you know you paid the highest price, boy, you can walk in there and say, I, I deserve a raise. <laughs> Y'all think I'm joking? We got testimonies of people who went on the fast last year and walked in and got promotions. There's some things you can do just by asking. There's got to be some stuff behind you, call a fast, pushing you into a place that they can't stop you. If she went in and didn't fast, she could have been killed. She knew it. But she paid the price of cleaning out any resistance to stop her success. Tell your neighbor this is it. I'm going to fast all through the year. Praise God. Every time you, there's a block, don't go to the restaurant. When there seems to be resistance, don't go to the restaurant. Your key is fasting. If I perish, I perish. She had paid the price. Here's another verse I thought was interesting. Psalm 109, David success. David says in Psalm 109, verse 24, a verse you never saw before, read it. He says, my knees give way from what? Fasting, my body is thin and gout. David was a politician. This is important. We need some of our politicians to read this. You know why our country is a mess? They can't figure it out? Because they don't want fast. They want to go and eat boiled fish every Saturday. We need some leaders in our government who would say, look, if I'm going to govern this country, I need a clean pipe. <laughs> David was a king. Can a king eat anything he wants? But David knew, if I'm going to rule Israel, I need the power of God. Now, look at the verse again. Some of you are going to be close to that on the 20th day. David was writing in that state. He picked up his pen, he wrote, my knees give way because I'm fasting. And my body is thin and fasting. He was a fasting king. And God said, David is a man after my own heart. I wonder if he's going to say that to you in this fast. This is my girl. She is after my own heart. She is chasing my heart by fasting. Another verse, Jeremiah 3, verse 9, read. In the ninth month, come on, in the ninth month of the fifth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah, a time of fasting before the Lord was proclaimed for who? All the people. The government declared everyone to stop eating. If you read the rest of that story, the battle that they fought, they won afterwards. They were being beaten by the enemy. Beaten. Go back to get beaten. And the king said, okay, hold it. No one eats until I say so. He proclaimed a fast for the whole country. 
Oh, Jesus. That means God had so many pipes. How can they lose? We are going to give God some pipes this next three weeks. God's going to have to heal our lands. Whatever country you're from, you believe God that this is going to be the fast to flush out everything that is not of God in your community. Can I hear an amen? Here's another verse. Daniel chapter 9. I love Daniel. Boy, he was a fasting guy. Daniel chapter 9 verse 3 read, So I turned to the Lord God, pleaded with him in prayer and petition, there it is in the Bible, in fasting and in sackcloth and ashes. How can Daniel lose? He put every word in the sentence. Now Daniel worked for who? King Nebuchadnezzar. He understood petitioning. He said, I didn't go to Nebuchadnezzar to petition. I went to my God, my government to petition. And I petitioned him with not just prayer, but with fasting. Daniel had power beyond prayer because he fasted. Another verse, Joel chapter 2, verse 12, read, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. How? With fasting and weeping and mourning. You really want to get back to God? God said, prove it. Stop eating. What? Stop what? God said, stop eating. Let me see if you come back to me. When you come back to God, you leave your flesh behind. Because God is a spirit. If you really love God, you leave your belly. That's what he's saying. If you can't sacrifice a little bit of gastric juice for me, how dare you convince me that you love me? And that's all that pain you feel is. It's just gastric juice. It's gases. You ain't dying. <laughs> that's, that's gastric juice burning the lining of your stomach and all that junk that's in your stomach and you, you think you're dying God says you love me more than gastric juices or would you sacrifice your father in heaven for gastric juices he said come to me weep before me in fasting a couple more verses Jeremiah 18 verse 7 read if at any time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down and destroyed, God says, and if that nation I warn repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I plan. Stop reading. Isn't that a beautiful verse? Bahamas, you are in trouble. I've already sent a curse on you. You've disobeyed me. This nation shall be destroyed. God says, now, what are you going to do about that? He tells us, if they repent and come before my face, I will reverse the curse that I proclaim on the country. When we come before God in prayer, we can change the destiny of a country. Look at verse 9. And if at another time I announce that a nation or a kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good that I had intended to do for that country. It's amazing, eh? In the Bahamas, we, we engraved in our constitution the statement that we will govern the Bahamas based on the principles of the Christian faith. God said, that's good. You all start all right. Now you're trying to move it. God said, okay, I changed my mind. God promised to bless you. He said, but you better stay right. Because I will reconsider. We can save our countries by fasting and prayer. So, let me give you what fasting is. And then tomorrow, we're going to talk about how to do it. First of all, fasting is the willful abstaining 
from natural pleasures for a spiritual purpose. Write that down. That's what fasting is. Very important to write that down. Fasting is the willful abstaining from natural pleasures for a spiritual purpose. Emphasis on willful. Willful means no one is forcing you. You made a decision. And notice the statement is very broad. Any natural pleasure. You could fast candies or ice cream or guava duff. Oh, Jesus, please. Help us, Lord. Whatever is your pleasure, you can fast that before God. You can fast sex. What a pleasure. God says, I want you to fast that. Because that can become a, a prison. What can be a greater pleasure? Than eating food. Oh, food is so nice. It's a pleasure. Fasting is abstaining from that pleasure. That's why we call it sackcloth and ashes. It's like, it's like beating your body. You know, sackcloth and ashes is sometime in movies, you see them in these religious movies, you see the, the priest would tear their clothes. You ever seen that? Yeah, they, they actually did that in that movie by Mel Gibson. What's the name of that movie? The passion. Yeah. Some of you all have missed that. The high priest tore his clothes. Uh, sackcloth and ashes is when you ran your clothes before God because of passion. Which means you tear away what is pleasure to you. Fasting is abstaining from pleasures. For what reason? Spiritual purpose. This is important. Fasting is not just missing a meal. It is for a spiritual purpose. That's why we meet every night. We're not just going out food for three weeks so you can lose weight. Losing weight is a byproduct of obedience to God. Fasting is when you set your face toward God. God says, you seek me. That's why we come here every night this week and next week and the week after. We're not here just to stop eating. We're here to find God. When you go home, you turn your TV off. Why? You're on a fast. You don't sit around gossip and conversations on a fast. You don't sit around the table talking about people. Why? You got to fast. That's why fasting many times demands you go into hiding. People went, you know, Elijah went to the hills to fast. Moses went to the mountain to fast. Jesus went to the desert to fast. Why? Because when you hang around people, they mess up your fast. On a fast, you stay away from people who have no positive impact on your life. You got to protect your environment on a fast. That's why many times on a fast, you got to go by yourself with your Bible every lunchtime and hide on the beach and read. You don't want to be around talking no junk. Why? You're trying to clean your spirit out. And there are people who will dump garbage in your spirit. You got to protect it. Abstaining. Number two, fasting is a personal commitment to renounce the natural in order to invoke the spiritual. Personal commitment to what? I can't hear you. To renounce the natural. In other words, I renounce the control of my stomach and my mind over my spirit. I renounce it today. That's consecration. Consecration is close to concentration, isn't it? It's from the same root word. To consecrate means to set yourself before God. You abstain because you have a spiritual desire. I want God and nothing else. So you stop seeking other things. Thirdly, fasting is the dedication to a period of time to devote yourself to spiritual priority of prayer. Without what? Food. Now, this is, there are different types of fasts in the Bible. And I want to say this while I got this chance. Some of you are on doctor's 
medication and orders. I want to warn you, if you are on doctor's orders, it's important for you to talk to your doctor because the doctor may recommend based on your present condition, which we believe will change before the end of this fast. But your present condition may require that you take certain medication to keep certain balances in your body. Please obey your doctor. I don't want anyone to tell any doctor I told them not to take their pills. Take your pills. But you can talk to your doctor about what I call a progressive fast. A progressive fast is where you can begin with the Daniel fast. Daniel fasted complete food fast, but he also fasted like just vegetation fast. Daniel told the king, I will not eat meat until the Lord hears my prayer. So he only ate vegetables. That's a fast. Then there's certain bread. Daniel said he would not eat. I will not eat bread with yeast in it, he says. I will fast yeast. Please check with your doctors. And see if they allow you to, to at least not need and begin the fast. And what's going to happen? As the fast progresses, you're going to find that your physical condition will begin to balance out. You will get a checkup every weekend. After this fast, the doctor will tell you certain things. He would say, what you doing? You ask him why. He say, look at your, something changing here. Your, your levels look like they're normal. And then he might say, whatever you're doing, keep doing. Because fasting brings healing speedily. I'm going to show you that tomorrow in the Bible. Fasting speeds up healing. One of the things I was shocked about when I discovered fasting as a teenager. When we were growing up, whenever somebody was sick, they would say, feed them. They need their energy. You remember that? Old people, feed them. You need it. Well, you're sick, you need something to eat. So as you call, <coughs> you need to eat something. They always want to feed you. Do you know that it's the opposite should be the case if you get the flu right now a fast will kick it out guaranteed guaranteed <laughs> but we, we are taught the opposite you need some soup son you need some like good old soup you're coughing you need some soup you no soup you need to stop eating <laughs> When an animal is sick, including a dog or a lion, what do they do? They hide from you. Why? Because they know you. Come Fido, kick, 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 kick. come Rover, come, come. And you start feeding the dogs and say, no, I'm going to hide until I am well. And then they show up after four days. They were fasting. Nature understands it. I tell you the truth. I used to suffer from hay fever every year, every year as a child. And I went on a 28-day fast, no food, just water. It never came back. Today, 30 years, no cold. Winter come, winter go, no cold. The fasting took away. Every ounce of virus. Tuberculosis. That 28 day fast took away every trace of tuberculosis of my body. Asthma. Sorry, asthma. Totally gone. Asthma. I had asthma. What did I say? Oh. It wasn't tuberculosis, it was asthma didn't sound right. I almost died from asthma. How can fasting heal asthma? It did. 40 years free. My God. Jesus. Don't tell me healing will not come speedily on a fast. You'll be amazed how well you can live on a fast. Half of the things you eat, you don't need. Fasting is not missing a meal. <laughs> you can hate this list. Fasting is not dieting. Write this down. Write this down so you can remember this one. Fasting 
demands replacing reading of the word and prayer with your meals. When you're on a fast, it doesn't mean you just stop eating and then you can do anything else. It means that you spend time with God every opportunity you, you, you have. When I'd be on a fast and I was working for different companies, including Mara Lumber Company, I worked for City Meat, other places, I said, we're going to be on fast. When my lunchtime came, I head to the beach on my bicycle and sit on the sand with my Bible. Everybody eating their fried chicken on the beach, reading the Word of God. That's how I fasted. Fasting means you replace your meals with the Word of God. Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by the Word of God. Fasting is for a spiritual purpose. You want to feed your spirit. The word of God is spiritual food. So you can't just fast and watch TV. I'm fasting, so I'm going to go ahead and go, to a, go, you know, go, go hang up with some people. Fasting means you've got to replace your normal activities with spiritual pursuits. This is fasting is for. Yep. Next one, number four. Fasting demands dedicating time for meditation. On this fast, you need to spend time. How about 2.4 hours every day? 10% of your day. Spending time quiet with God, having devotions with God. That means getting a devotional book that we have in the bookstore is a good way to start. And every day you read a devotion and spend time with God. God will deal with you if you deal with God. Sometimes God ain't got time to talk to us because we don't stay place, one place long enough. Lord Jesus, bless me in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. God said, wait, 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 wait. Come back here. Wait. You didn't, you didn't hear. I, I, I ain't had time to answer you yet. We go to work. God says, what are you doing? <laughs> Some of y'all laughing, y'all look guilty. That's them 15 seconds prayer. Meditation is important in fasting. All right? And number five, fasting requires spending much time in the Word. This is where you read chunks of the Word of God. You get in your spirit. I, I'm telling you, fasting is, what I love about fasting, it saves time. Your time becomes so disciplined. You'll be amazed. Fasting chops out all the garbage out of your life in time wasters. For example, it takes eight hours to prepare a meal. Did you know that? Eight hours to prepare a meal and eight minutes to eat it. <laughs> Some of you all, four minutes. They calculated what it takes to prepare a meal. Their conclusion is eight hours. I didn't realize that. For example... All right, you're going to prepare a meal for your family tomorrow. When do you start thinking about it? So the meal starts. You start right now. Tomorrow I'll cook fish and do this for the kids. I'll cook this for my well, husband or wife. And, okay, so the, the meal started right there. And now your mind's working on this meal. So you can't focus on God right now. You're thinking about what you're going to cook tomorrow. Then you go to the food store and you buy the stuff. And then you've got to put it up. And then you've got to make sure you're home in time and you start preparing it. And then you got to make sure, chop this, chop that, cut that, fry this, do this, do that. And by the time you finish it's eight hours of thinking, planning, preparing, cooking, and serving. Eight hours. When you fast, you get all that back. I get more work done on a fast than I do all year. Because you get time to think for the first time without distraction. You get time to plan. God get time to give you instructions to save you time. God gives you answers to questions quickly on a fast. Fasting makes your brain sharp. It makes your memory so sharp you remember things you forgot. <laughs> Fasting is so awesome that, that when you read things, you retain them. Fasting is incredible. Fasting gives you songs in the night. You wake up singing for no reason at all. Watch, this is going to happen to you. Fasting drives people out of your life who ain't supposed to be there. They'll just leave. You don't know why they left. Praise the Lord, they're gone. Fasting will clean out your life. Fasting is powerful. It's powerful. So spend time in the word of the Lord. And let God give you the wisdom. Isaiah 58. 
verse 3, God asks the question, why have, he, he said, you say, why have we fasted? And you have not seen it. Uh-oh. God says, you want me to answer that question? Why have we humbled ourselves? There's the word, fasted. And you have not noticed. God answers them. He said, because on the day of your fasting, <laughs> you watch LMN, LMN. God's answer. God said, I, I know you ain't eating, but what you doing in this place? Isn't that crazy? God said, you can't fool me. You say you're on a fast and you're still doing all these things and doing all these people and talking and gossiping. He said, what is this? You know, fast. All you're doing is missing a meal because a fast is consecration before me. The reason why we do this for 30 years, we meet every night and pray and teach the word is because we have to make sure everybody is focused on God. If we leave you home when you go home, we don't know what you're doing. We got to encourage one another. Stay focused on God. Yeah. People come home and say, I just, I just baked this cake, drop this by for you. But you ain't home. You're in prayer meeting, see? And by the time you get all pumped up when you come here, you go and see the cake, get that cake from the front of me. Why? Man, I got my focus on God. But if you stay home, <laughs> no feeding your spirit. And here comes a carrot cake with icing, with nuts on top, and the cake's still warm. Iko brasate, randa buraba basa. Ooh, I felt the anointing of God just now. <laughs> Ooh. Then you start saying things like, a little piece would know it. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I've been there. God rebuked me many times. What you doing? I said, oh, sorry for that. That was close. <laughs> you want to always protect your environment. He says, look at God. God says, you do what you please. You exploit all of your workers. Your fast ends in what? Quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. In other words, you fussing people on a fast, cussing people in the office on a fast, fighting people on the construction job on a fast. Cause it just ain't no fast. Cancel. Start over. Yeah. Keep your attitude right. Look at the last part of verse. He says, "What? You cannot fast as you do today, and expect your voice to be heard on high." I rest my case. <laughs> It's possible to waste your time fasting if you don't fast properly. It's not just abstaining from food. It's for a spiritual purpose. You have a reason for putting away the plate. You're pursuing God's plate. Last part of the verse, Matthew 4, to read. After fasting 40 days, he was hungry. Your body can go without food for 40 days. Did you know that? No food. It can go without water for three days. And then it begins to die. It can go without food for 40. Then it becomes hungry. No human has fasted more than 40 days. None. Because your body is designed by God to live without substance for 40 days. After 40 days, your body begins to eat itself. That's called starvation. Starvation doesn't set in until after 40 days. So when you feel the pain tomorrow, at 12 o'clock, in the middle of the day, stop telling people, I'm starving. No, 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 no. When was he hungry? Hunger doesn't set in 
until after 40 days. So what you call hunger is not hunger if you haven't eaten for four days. What you're feeling is habit. The gastric juices, your, your, your conditioning of your body is crying out for all the habitual junk that you've been putting down. So you'll find that every time you ate meal traditionally is when you're going to feel the need for food tomorrow. If you ate breakfast every morning at 8 o'clock, at 8 o'clock, there are going to be some problems for a little while. What do you do? You drink a lot of water. That's all. You want to dilute the acids. That burning, that ain't the devil, no demons. That's just acid. <laughs> <laughs> Tomorrow I'm going I'm to explain to you what to expect on a fast. Okay, so make it through tomorrow, then you'll be okay. But fasting is very predictable. You know what's going to happen. I'm going to show you that in detail. What what's going to happen? But you don't starve until after 40 days. So don't ever tell anybody you starving. You ain't starving until after 40 days. Matthew 6:18. Read. When you fast, do not look somber as hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men of their fasting. Please don't walk around telling anybody tomorrow, I want to fast. Mind your business, just go do your work. Don't walk around with your Bible in your hand, pray, you could, mama. shut up, man. They ain't supposed to even know you're fasting. It says, fix your hair and bathe and wash your face. Why? You ain't fasting to please people. You're fasting before your father. You're seeking your father's face, not other people's opinions. Yes? Matthew 6, 17, read. So that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is where? Unseen. And your father who sees what is done in secret will do what? Reward you openly. The results of your fast is what they're going to see. They ain't going to see you fasting. They're going to see the evidence that you have placed your face toward God. Second Chronicles 20, verse 3, I love this, read it, read it aloud. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for the whole country. Jehoshaphat was one of the greatest kings of Israel. And he was a king, every time he had a problem, he solved it by fasting. He called a fast. I am here to say, we all must fast. Here's our mark. The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from you. And on that day, you will fast. The bridegroom has gone. So we have to fast. Acts 13, 2, read out loud. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work I come to do. The church that Paul attended didn't just pray. They fasted. During this fast, God's going to perhaps indicate to me as a leader who I should ordain. That happens during a fast. Most of the time, the people I appoint in this ministry came through a fast. Because God will speak to you and give you discernment of things that you cannot get with a full stomach. Paul was chosen. His name was changed to Saul. I mean to Paul, to Saul was chosen during a fast by his church to go out. Acts 14, 2, read. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Paul understood that prayer wasn't enough. When it comes down to choosing people, you better get some power. Discern people. Discern the spirit world and hear God's voice. Some of you want to get married and someone say they love you, go on a fast. I'm serious. God will clean you up fast. Because your head and your flesh will kapunkle you up. You understand me? He laughing, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you, can get, you can get kapunkle right up. People say, I love you. You stay there. You better go on a fast. Check this out. Because when you wake up in the morning, you realize, what is this? And I'm serious, you gotta, you got to get God's voice when you're choosing people in your life. Sometimes you're offered a position on a job and it looks good, just tell them, uh, give me a couple of days. And then go on a fast. We, we, we don't do those things. That's called, that is called inquiring of the Lord. 
Let me go and consider it. And we go and we call everybody else except God. What you think? What you think? What you think? God said, you never came to me. When you're making choices that will affect your life, you need to inquire of the Lord. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.